Today, on episode number 804 of CXO Talk, we're discussing enterprise AI with Aaron Levy, the co founder and CEO of Box. We have a fairly unique perspective on uh, the AI conversation simply because of how much data. Uh, is inside the Box platform. So we have hundreds of petabytes of, of, uh, of content, tens and tens of billions of files. And in every single one of those documents, it could be a contract, a marketing asset, a financial record, an HR document. And every single one of those, those, uh, those documents is uh, incredibly rich and, and valuable information. So the types of concerns and the types of conversations we have with our customers are, okay, how do I actually bring the power of large language models to all of this data? How do I keep my data secure while interacting with it uh, through l- large language models? How do I ensure I'm remaining compliant with all of the different industry standards um, that I have to be able to support now that I'm using AI in- inside of my business? So there's a very wide range of, of, I think, challenges, but also opportunities that AI presents. They really want to lean into AI. They want to have an AI-first business and business model, but they need ways of connecting AI to their data. What about the maturity of their usage? So if you talk with people in, in larger companies or, or mid-sized companies, I'm sure there are varying degrees of AI maturity. It's a situation where I think everybody is, is probably, you know, kind of relatively immature, um, you know, compared to, to what the technology is capable of today. At the same time, probably the same level of maturity uh, relative to just their, their their peers, in the sense of of I'm I'm not seeing a lot of companies that are like years ahead of of everybody else uh, in the field. Um, you know, we have a we've had a breakthrough technology just in the past 12 months, which is ChatGPT and some of the underlying large language models that that power ChatGPT, and so it's almost impossible for any one company to be that many years ahead of, of, of the rest of the industry. So, so I think, you know, we'll look back and, and realize this was a period of, ex- of, of we were extremely early in an incredibly long trend um, and transformation of the enterprise. Um, and at the same time, I think companies are aggressively leaning in, trying to figure out where is the big opportunity um, you know, for AI in their business. Uh, you know, we we uh, we hosted a dinner last week with about 15 CIOs of, you know, a, a range of different industries, um, financial services, uh, real estate, uh, media and and, uh, and marketing and entertainment. And the amazing thing was, um, was uh, you know, universally, everybody was diving right into AI. Um, everybody was was diving in with a you know a similar degree of 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 kind of maturity and you know building out uh, their their architectures and frameworks and um, and task force uh, around how they're going to leverage AI in their business. And yet, and yet, every single one of them was insanely early. Uh, in in the journey, um, you know, very few companies had done sort of wholesale kind of company wide production deployments of of large language models. You know, it was a lot of experimentation, uh, a lot of experimentation, a lot of testing on different teams and different departments. There were a few that had you know leaned in maybe more aggressively, but we're so early. I think we're going to look back in you know three or five or ten years, and uh, and and this is going to be you know um, you know just scratching the surface of uh, of what's possible with AI is what we're seeing today. So what I'm taking away from this is you're seeing a lot of enthusiasm, but there's also a lot of, we could say, confusion about what the opportunities are, even what some of the challenges that may emerge are, and how to invest in this thing that's this incredibly moving target. I want to find the right word for confusion in the sense of I think it's actually fairly structured and fairly, um, uh, you know, you have fairly methodical um, uh, that, that what, what customers are working through. So so it's it's some kind of like enlightened ver- version of confusion, which is which is sort of everybody has some pretty clear perspective on what they like to do. But we're so early in what do these architectures need to look like? Where um, where should companies be investing their time and resources simply because we haven't developed the patterns as an industry yet? You know, when you think about like the reference architectures um, over the years for, you know, how do you manage databases? How do you manage the cloud? How do you manage DevOps? We don't have these reference architectures uh, for AI yet. All we really know is that, that, that we are in this massive tidal wave of large language models and, and an incredible kind of leapfrogging um, you know, of these platforms, but we're so early and the reference architectures aren't there. And so companies are 
all trying to, you know, kind of figure out from, from their peers and from the industry and from vendors, you know, where all of this is going. So, you know, a lot of our conversations with customers really orients around how do you create the highest degree of optionality? So, um, you know, today OpenAI is very clearly the leader in terms of the, the most advanced AI models, but at the same time, we're seeing breakthroughs from other players. So how do you have high degree of optionality? Where you can, you know, swap in different components at different times. How do you have an architecture that is, is future proof to all of these, um, you know, kind of trends that are going to, you know, continue to happen in this space? How do you ensure data protection and privacy and security so you don't have any kind of leakage of your data between models or accidentally users are getting information that they shouldn't have access to? Um, and then, and then how do you, you know, kind of test and iterate and, um, and make sure that, that you're, you're sort of scaling you know, with uh, with the rate of how this industry is changing. And so a lot of our conversations with customers are more at that kind of philosophical level. How do you implement a, a strategy in AI uh, that lets you get the most out of it, you know, not just, you know, today and right now, but over the next three and five and 10 years? So what about this investment issue, since there are so many, so many unknowns at this time, what do you tell your clients, your customers about how to invest? As you said, there, are, there aren't the reference architectures yet, but we need to be doing something. So what should we be doing? A lot of our conversation with customers is trying to figure out where is there so much untapped value inside their enterprise relative to the data that they have. So, um, you know, where are their insights? Where's their where are their productivity gaps? Uh, where could you be making better decisions? Where could you be enabling employees to work more productively based on the information that, that you have inside of your enterprise? So, you know, in some companies, that's going to be um, in their go to market team. So how can they sell to their clients faster? In some companies, that's going to be in R&D. Uh, how do you develop products more quickly, leveraging your, your, your data or using AI as an assistant to make you more productive? So we're, we're you know, working with companies, um, again, in every single industry. And I think where the value creation is in that industry is going to um, uh, really lead you to where the biggest AI outcomes are, are likely to be. So, you know, as a software company, um, we spend a lot of time trying to rapidly build software. So we want to use AI to help our engineers be very productive. And at the same time, we need to be able to sell and market and, and bring that software to our customers. So we want to use AI to facilitate how do we actually get this technology in the hands of, of our, our customers as quickly as possible. So I think, you know, businesses that really understand where do they have a, a tremendous amount of data? What is inside of that data? What could that data uh, uh, produce for their organization that would would give them, um, you know, some some form of of extra value? Uh, whether it's again what they're building, serving their customers, employee, uh, you know, culture, operations, and uh, and that's where AI can have you know some of the biggest impact in their in their business. At Box, you're you're an enterprise, and you're having to deal with these same issues in many respects. This moving target. How do you manage it? We sort of have two big components. One is how do our employees leverage AI, um, and uh, and in that case, you know, fortunately, we're able to use a lot of our own technology. So we we announced a product called Box AI um, that allows you to quickly ask questions of any kind of document or information. It lets you generate content uh, inside of uh, inside of our product as well. So we use Box AI to you know do everything from whether it's drafting a new communication for uh, for a sales rep or um, summarizing a. a, a critical contract that we're working on to accelerate the, the contract life cycle. Uh, we want to use AI across our entire business to make all of our employees more productive. And then equally, we want to build AI into our product in a way that gives our customers an extreme amount of leverage in how they bring large language models to their data. And so we've had a lot of companies come to us and say, hey, you know, I, I have thousands or tens of thousands or millions of documents uh, that I want to be able to use AI against. So I have a bunch of invoices or contracts or um, uh, uh, lease agreements that, that I want to be able to use AI to extract information from or summarize or provide some kind of expertise or opinion on. And, um, and instantly what, what happens is when they start to think about that problem, they're, they're you know, thinking about, okay, so how do I convert these documents into an AI ready format? So I have to create you know, vector embeddings on these documents and store them in a vector database. Then I've got to be able to run AI models against the, the data inside that vector database. Then I have to have an interface that end users can interact with. And then I have to have security and, and permissions and access controls of who can access that data. And very quickly, I mean, this is a multi-hundred engineer type problem that our customers are, are dealing with. And this is exactly what our platform uh, is meant to go and simplify. So if you think about what we've been building for well over a decade and a half is a platform that lets you securely store, manage, share, 
provide the access controls for and interaction of all of your unstructured data, all of your unstructured content. And now what we're doing is connecting AI models to that data in a very secure and compliant way. So for us internally, building out our platform, the way we think about it is how do we have a modular architecture where we can bring in AI models from any vendor that we uh, that our customers are gonna wanna work with over time and be able to help our customers take full advantage of all of the amazing innovation that's happening today. Please subscribe to our newsletter, subscribe to our YouTube channel, check out cxotalk.com. We have amazing shows coming up. What about from a business process standpoint? You just spoke about it from a product standpoint, but what about the use of AI in a practical way inside Box? We encourage our employees to use uh, AI uh, in any way that can make them both more productive, but also where um, where we're protecting any kind of risk in our, our business. So, um, so you know, the, the kind of classic example is if you use AI to, let's say, help you optimize a uh, code that you're working on, you are still responsible uh, for what you ultimately put into the code base um, as an individual. So there's no way that, that you know, you could ever say, um, hey, you know, AI told me to do this and I did it and it didn't work. And so I'm going to blame the AI. So the employee still retains uh, and remains fully responsible for everything that, that happens um, uh, in their use of AI. So that, that's the first kind of most important part of how we think about AI. Um, we also make sure that, that employees don't um, use any kind of sensitive information, any customer data, any personal uh, uh, information in AI models that we don't have full control over. Um, and so this is why having dedicated instances of AI models is very important um, and ensuring that there's no training um, or sharing of any data that happens uh, when you're using that that underlying AI, AI model. And so we're fortunate because within our own product, Box AI, um, we're able to leverage you know, dedicated, isolated, safe and secure um, AI for all of our data. And um, and again, that, that can be anything from a, a sales rep drafting, up, drafting uh, an email that's going to go out to a customer. They want to get uh, AI to help them very quickly with that. Uh, it could be a, a lawyer that is summarizing a contract and um, and quickly extracting critical clauses that they need to get from that contract. It could be a marketing um, professional at Box that needs help on kind of what's the new message for a particular marketing effort or a new press release. So we use our own product, Box AI, for helping us across all of those types of use cases in the business. And, you know, in some cases that might be a 5 or 10% productivity gain. In other cases, it could save, you know, employee hours and hours uh, from a task that they were otherwise going to do. How do you manage the hallucinations or the, or the more broadly the risk of inaccuracy seeping in? We spend a tremendous amount of time on this on this issue of uh, hallucination. So, um, if you just uh, you know sent a, a document to any kind of you know average AI model, you have a high risk where uh, as the AI you know reads that document. Um, there's a high high chance that it's going to you know hallucinate uh, to some extent. So so we spend a tremendous amount of time in our backend systems um, in terms of how we do the vector embeddings of the document, what AI models we use in terms of where we send the underlying content, um, and the prompt itself uh, that we've really spent a lot of time on uh, working to ensure that there's as little hallucination to no hallucination as possible. So, um, so we we have um, you know worked to make sure that we remove the uh, the likelihood of and reduce the likelihood of the AI model coming back with an answer that is sort of not based on the underlying text uh, that we're giving it. And uh, and then we um, uh, are continuing to work on improved ways of offering citations. So you have instant ways of seeing hey, this is why the AI gave you this answer or this recommendation. So you as a user have full control and visibility and sort of explainability on how the AI came up with what it came up with. And that, that's going to be incredibly important as a sort of a fundamental user right in the future is to understand, well, you know, how did AI make this recommendation of, you know, what you know, healthcare um, uh, outcome to uh, to recommend, or what financial um, uh, suggestion to make, or you know, what were the meeting notes of that meeting? You want explainability in the underlying um, uh, recommendations from the AI model. So, building in that audit trail capability, essentially. That's right. That's exactly right. We have an interesting question from Twitter, and this is from Arsalan Khan, who's a regular listener, and he asks really thoughtful questions. And, and Arsalan, thank you for all your questions. And he says this, he says, 
the by and large today's push for AI is because of the release of chat GPT back in November. Previously enterprises were, or why he says were enterprises timid to really get involved with AI before then. And what are enterprises timid about today? And I'll just mention that I think one of the answers, at least to the first part, why were enterprises timid before, is this is a marketing thing. I mean, chat GPT, it's marketed AI. The chat GPT moment was, uh, was incredibly um, uh, unique and idiosyncratic, uh, where, where it was the combination of a of, of just frankly the best large language model that, that we ha have ever seen up to that point, which was uh, GPT 3.5. So this is where um, uh, they had um, uh, the, the, the reinforcement learning mechanism with, with, human, uh, with, with human feedback. So, um, so that was really important uh, for tuning the model in a way that provided you good answers. So you, so you had both the model itself um, as, uh, as being a kind of a unique moment and then the interface of having a conversational UI to a large language model was also really important. So, you know, for, for, for those of us that have been doing this for a while, you'll know that, that you go to openai.com, you know, maybe a year and a half ago, and you have this sort of playground environment. And, and really all it is is, a, is just one text box, and you have to type in, and then, and then the AI model kind of continues on the text um, that, that you were writing, but that's not like a, an intuitive interface for the average consumer. That it's a, it's a really just kind of a, again, a kind of sandbox playground type, type, uh, type environment. And so it was that combination of a chat interface and a very, very powerful model that I think created the ability for consumers to see, you know, holy crap, this is the power of, of actually AI right now. So, you know, I think in a, in a really weird way, it probably would not have been possible for everyone to have this kind of form of enlightenment and excitement um, prior to a year ago. And, uh, and so we're really kind of only about a year into this modern wave of AI. I mean, it's, it really was the iPhone moment um, of AI because it was the first time that we had a uh, you know, commercial at scale way of experiencing what AI is going to be able to do for us. At this point, you know, if we look at it, you know, we're almost a year into the kind of, you know, the first anniversary of, uh, of ChatGPT, about 10 months in. And, you know, at this point, I think the, there's probably still more questions than even answers, which is, okay, how do we deal with the privacy of, uh, of AI? How do we deal with the copyright, you know, po potential challenges? You know, we're seeing, uh, you know, examples come out from the, uh, um, you know, various judges that say, okay, you can't patent um, or you can't copyright the works uh, that an AI model is producing. That's going to have some really new, interesting consequences. Which is, if you're a marketing team or you're a product development team, and you use AI to to help you with some kind of part of your product, you know how much of that is going to be patentable, depending on which which part you know kind of AI played a role in in creating. So there's many more questions at this stage um, that that I think ChatGPT has sort of thrust onto the market. But it's actually good that that it's happening that way. You know, this is something where you almost need to we need some kind of trial by fire. We have to actually see. Um, what, what, uh, you know, where the edges of this technology are and how the market evolves. This is not something you kind of like overthink. You kind of have to explore and experiment and have, you know, real examples to, to figure out where the boundaries are here. So the second part of his question is what are folks in the enterprise business leaders and technology leaders timid about today as far as adoption goes? I think you've touched on some of it. The bigger things usually are around security privacy, um, uh, uh, you know, copyright, you know, challenges, risk, litigation, all, all of that. These are all very real, I think, open questions. I think companies are making great strides to helping companies, you know, work through this and, and deal with this. Within Box, for instance, again, um, our commitment is ensuring that, you know, no data uh, if no customer data is ever used to train any model whatsoever. That's a very important commitment. Um, we have a commitment that there's no, um, you know, logging or exhaust that happens in the process that, that improves the model. Um, we also, because of our architecture, ensure that there's no data leakage where one user might be using AI to access data that another user, um, you know, was, uh, what, what, you know, owned or, or had access to. So, um, so you ensure that there's, you know, kind of firewalls between what each individual user experiences, um, in terms of the content that they can access. So these are the things that customers are, I think, very rightly concerned about. And these are the, the areas that our platform is, is meant to go and help customers with. How do you think about this copyright issue? I mean, these or or some of these things you're just describing, they're very tricky, thorny issues. 
we're still very early into you know both the precedents and the kind of case law that, that gets set for this. Um, I think it's a it's a really interesting tension where um, there's no question that um, that that uh, you know there's sort of two sides. There's the how the model got created itself and how much you know copyrighted work. Uh, went into the model. And then the other question is, can you copyright things that the model, you know, produces as an output? And I think in both of these things, you know, we're, we're we are at the start of, of just an unprecedented period of, of how this technology works. So, you know, there's a really interesting question of, of, you know, what is the role of the rights holder in the training process? Um, you know, we're seeing great examples where you can block access to your content from, from being trained on that, that, you know, having that right is, is obviously a great idea. There's some examples of, um, you know, companies saying, okay, we want to get paid, uh, for access to our information or for the, the rights to our data. And that, that also makes a, a ton of sense. I think there's going to be some complexity if the models, you know, kind of attempt to keep track of all of the rights holders inside the model, um, and then you know, paying some kind of residual or or some kind of fee for usage. That 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 feels you know something that will probably be impossible technically at scale to to really achieve. Um, so we're really gonna have to figure out how these models get trained um, and uh, and how you kind of keep track of of some of the rights elements in that. And then on the other hand, you have the what the model produces and how much of that is copyrightable. Um, and I think we're, we're, again, witnessing some really interesting cases right now that, that uh, are, are centered around this. And so then there's this question of how much did the human do and how much did the AI do? And, and where in that kind of continuum, if the AI did the vast majority of the creation, then I think it's, it's reasonable that a human is not going to be able to, to get a copyright, um, you know, for that output. But, uh, but this is very, you know, this, this is a very nuanced, uh, topic because we have to decide, you know, what is the percentage that humans do? You know, for, for a hundred plus years, you know, humans have been using, you know, some form of mechanical, um, uh, technology or computer technology to, to produce things that we then patent. And so, so, you know, clearly we've, we've already had, um, you know, uh, so much, uh, precedent for this idea that I'm, I'm going to use a technology to create something that I, that I become the rights holder for. So AI is just another accelerant of that trend. Um, but when does it cross over into something that, that is now, you know, now, now the computer is doing the vast majority of the work and how do we think through that? Just laughing to myself as you were talking, because you could define a percentage, but it doesn't work that way because right. the two become infused and melded to get like a mind meld of the two. And how do you how do you separate it? I mean, just like Photoshop, let's just say. So if I created a, an image in Photoshop, you know, five years ago, um, do I own the copyright to that? Yes. But clearly Photoshop is giving me tools that that allow me to produce something that I would never have been able to produce before. And AI is in many respects another step in that direction, but there is something about the AI doing the extra work of of the creative process or um, the production process that exceeds our our typical way of defining tools, and so it's it's giving us all this new surface area and ground to cover that we're we're going to have to deal with, you know, from a legal standpoint. So, given all of this, you've laid out the challenges quite well. What do you recommend that? again, business leaders and technology leaders actually do today? What we're seeing a lot from our, our customers is the first, you know, setting up these kind of cross-functional groups uh, to go and identify where AI can be applied in the business, how they can ap apply it safely, dealing with the legal and compliance and security uh, decisions. So, you know, for literally the past nine months, we've had a standing working group um, that is that that where where uh, we have representatives from privacy, legal, security, compliance, the business, and technology come together and say where are we going to use AI in our business to be as productive as possible, but do so in a way that is sort of legally you know safe and um, and 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 compliant with uh, the industry standards that, that we have. And so I, I you know I first recommend all you know enterprises um, you know build some form of of committee or working group that can help with that. And then, um, then the second thing is you need to make sure that you have a, a framework or an architecture that allows you to, again, have a future-proofed 
AI strategy. There's so much changing in the industry right now. I think it's it's um, it behooves most businesses to have a high degree of optionality and and sort of range of motion of how they implement AI in their business because we are so early in this next wave of of AI that it's going to be really important that that you know you don't over lean into one particular path or, or direction. So that's the second piece. And then the third final piece I would say is you need to test. You need to get ideas from the business. You have to get use cases from the actual users. So I think being you know, maybe a, a, a bit permissive on, on what people do with the technology just so you can learn from them, but, but short of being fragmented and, and too decentralized that you get, you know, utter chaos. And so we're seeing co- some customers do hackathons where, you know, they want employees to test with AI to figure out if some business process could be improved because of AI. Um, or they're, they're letting company, uh, their, their employees start to use AI for different use cases and then they want to learn from those so they can standard acro- standardize across the business. So, um, so those probably be the three key things. Task force, um, for figuring out the standards, optionality in the in the core architecture, you, so you have a future-proof architecture, and three, test, iterate, get some of that kind of decentralized use cases going. So the technical architecture is a very important foundation, getting that right. It's a wave of technology where your your architecture will define your strategy. Um, the, the architecture you land on for using AI on your data will 100% create a, uh, a, a, a fixed outcome of, of how you're going to be able to leverage uh, AI in the future. And so getting that right, having a high degree of flexibility, understanding that there's a lot of different model competition right now. So you want to be in a position where you're not overly wedded or stuck to just one particular model provider, given how much competition there is. Um, I think that, that that's going to be super important for enterprises. Can you elaborate on that? That seems like a very important point. You just said that absolutely your technical architecture will determine your strategy. We're seeing a lot of companies sort of just struggle with, okay, where, what kind of bets do you make right now and um, versus where do you want flexibility? And Jeff Bezos had has this line um, that, that I think is just probably the most important way to think about a lot of technology, which is one-way doors versus two-way two day doors. And one-way doors are, you go, uh, maybe we'll start with two-way doors. Two-way doors, um, uh, you, you basically can go in and out of them and change your mind. So you can iterate, you can pivot, you can, you can move around, you can adapt quickly. And one-way doors, once you go through it, you're, you're sort of stuck. You're on the other end of that door and, and there's no going back. And so everything you do subsequent to that going through that door, you are stuck with that decision. And I think AI offers a lot of these sort of two-way door versus one-way door type decisions. A two-way door in the AI world is how do you have an abstraction layer from your business process or your data from the AI models. So that way I have the ability to swap in different providers or different components over time as there's more advanced technology or more advanced breakthroughs on the AI front. A one-way door would be saying, I'm gonna be stuck with one particular model or one particular AI paradigm right now and I'm gonna build right on top of that. Now, that offers some benefits because you know, verti- anytime you do sort of vertical integration, there's some efficiency gain for that. The challenge, of course, in AI is, I would say, on a ver- on like a weekly or, or you know, at least twice monthly basis, we are seeing some breakthrough in AI where one company is leapfrogging another. You know, we we have OpenAI, uh, we have Anthropic, we have Google, we have Amazon. Uh, we now have Meta releasing Llama and Llama Two. So you have this incredible sort of of set of leapfrog events that are happening in the industry. And I think it, it, it's gonna behoove most enterprises to have an architecture that allows them to take advantage of, of these breakthroughs and not be overly stuck to one particular paradigm, particularly just this early in the evolution of AI. You know, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, I'm gonna dedicate a full team to building iOS apps. Because you just know, okay, you know, 90% of your employee base is going to use iOS, uh, you know, at, at, at this point, you know, if, if, uh, if, you're, uh, if, if you're an example enterprise. But with AI, we're just, we're just so early. We don't know, you know, which model or which par- particular paradigm is going to win out at this stage. So having that flexibility, having that optionality, I think is going to be very key for, uh, for customers. And that's certainly what our platform is, uh, is, is meant to deliver. So we have a question from Shelly Lucas. She's at Pisa Rose on Twitter. And she says, the demand for AI has outpaced chip supply. How much should enterprises invest in AI development when chip production is so limited? If you're an enterprise, I think right now is the wrong time, let's say, to be doing lots of 
deep, deep custom model training. Because we're at the, uh, you know, to Shelly's point, we're at the sort of peak of, of a supply demand imbalance, which means that there's limited supply for, uh, for GPUs and for, you know, the, the kind of core infrastructure to train models. And we're at peak demand, not, not, not peak demand, but we're peak relative demand, um, to, to what we've seen in, in recent years, which means that it, the costs are going up dramatically. And so you would be, you know, doing things like experimenting or training models at a, at a point where, where it's extremely expensive to do so because there's so much scarcity of, uh, of the underlying infrastructure, uh, to be able to do that versus maybe in a year or two from now, um, that, that cost curve coming down. So I think there's a huge premium on building the layer above the model training, plugging into, to platforms like OpenAI or, or Azure or Anthropic and, and being able to use those, those models to really perfect you know, what can you do within your business um, uh, to, to leverage AI? And then as the cost curve comes down on, on training your own models, um, I think that starts to become much more, much more realistic and, and reasonable for enterprises. Now, there's a lot of different paths companies are taking. And I think there's, there's no sort of wrong answer right now. But, um, but to Shelly's specific point, I think right now, um, I would be spending more time on the abstraction layer of AI as opposed to just pure training of models because of where we are in the cost curve on, on model training. Arsalan Khan comes back with another question. He says, to use AI for decision-making, we need to have the right data and the right algorithms at the right time. Do you advise organizations to do proper data management and to know about their algorithms before using AI or to do it all at the same time? It's a really thoughtful question. The right answer, like academically, is is get your mo- get your data into a good spot, have it organized well, have the right kind of permissions and controls, and then layer in AI on top of that. That is that is sort of like what what the, the you know the 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 intellectually correct you know answer is in this kind of case. The reality is the space is moving so quickly. Some companies can't afford, um, or they don't believe they can afford, or uh, or there's other you know business imperatives that are demanding the need to to do both of these simultaneously. And, um, and so, so the, 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 the sort of practical answer right now is that a lot of companies are going to have to get, um, you know, moving on both fronts in parallel. But no matter what, you literally can't use AI uh, effectively if your data is not organized properly in a good position with the right access controls in a secure and compliant way. It's just literally impossible. Um, you know, we've, we've heard of examples of, of a company that says, you know, hey, here's an AI interfa- interface for a- interacting with data in my enterprise. They shove all the data kind of close to that AI model, but they forget to have any kind of access controls. And then all of a sudden, somebody does an AI kind of question, and they get an answer for something that they're not allowed to see. So almost by definition, you know, you you, you do have to get your data into a good spot. It has to be organized properly. It has to be securely, um, uh, you know, kind of protected with the right types of access controls. And then AI really comes on top of that. So you have to, whether you whether you do it ahead of time or you do it at the same time, it needs to be done. And it has to be done first, but I do see companies having to say, you know what, uh, we, we have to move on this in parallel. We have a very interesting question from Mike Prest. He's chief information officer at a private equity investment group. This is from LinkedIn, and he says the following. Elon Musk mentioned this week that he thinks it's very likely that there could be a federal regulatory agency for AI. As a business leader, what are your thoughts on potential regulation for the development of AI? I'm firmly in the optimistic camp of of what tech of what AI is going to enable. I think it's going to actually enable more jobs. I think it'll enable more fulfilling jobs. Um, I think it'll make us all, uh, you know, kind of more productive. And in my definition, that just means working on the things that that humans are are better enabled to do and and that are more creative and that we get more fulfillment from so i'm i'm firmly and deeply on the camp of of ai is a is a total net positive almost universally you know there'll be a couple examples of some roles that need to evolve and um and, and some jobs that will need to shift but for the most part i think this is great for for students and for healthcare and for uh for for uh for for financial um uh you know preparedness and for employee productivity so i think it's all all you know pretty net net positive on those fronts at the same time um you know we there are there are some areas of risk there are areas of risk around security there's areas of national um you know kind of security risk in uh, in in the space of ai i'm not 
you know, in the camp with that, that AI is in any any point in the foreseeable future going to go rogue or uh, start to make decisions on its own in, in a kind of a, in a dangerous way. But I do think there are real risks um, that we have to pay attention to. And so whether that is the creation of a federal agency just dedicated to AI or within the construct of an existing framework or agency, um, I think the government is going to have to pay attention to this, is going to have to kind of create some rules of the road. But I would be more in the camp of of being, you know, on the margin more open than closed uh, about that approach. Uh, I think that we should not just have AI in the hands of three or five, you know, companies that that uh, that just happen to be the, the companies that have all of the scale and can can work with with all of the regulations. I do think this is a technology that is meant to be, and and it's important for it to be um, diffuse and um, and to some extent decentralized uh, with open source approaches and closed source approaches and commercial approaches and public private you know approaches. So I, I would be um, I would definitely be sensitive to over regulation at this stage. Um, in the uh, in the development of this technology, and I, I'm firmly in the camp that this is sort of not um, a uh, a technology that is um, equivalent to things like nuclear um, or some of the maybe more you know uh, uh, you know technologies that we think about as more on the destructive side. I think this is much more akin to the internet or the computer chip, um, and we, we we clearly don't have you know regulatory bodies that control those things. We have frameworks. Uh, that that uh, that that each individual industry or part of society, um, you know, uh, has uh, has had to kind of mature around those types of technologies. And so I, I probably on the margin are in uh, more in that kind of camp. Um, but I think uh, I think our government in the U.S. at least is is you know taking a thoughtful approach to this. Um, and so far, I've I've been uh, optimistic from what I've seen. Since Mike Prest brought up Elon Musk, any thoughts on Elon Musk? How he uses social media? Anything at all? <laughs> at all? <laughs> uh, that that is um, uh, that's about a three hour conversation. So uh, I, I would just say, you know, we we live in a a very surreal world with um, that makes it feel like a simulation sometimes, and uh, um, and and I'm just I'm just watching from afar, and uh, but I'll I'll keep on on posting online, and we'll see where that gets us. So you're watching the simulation from afar, and probably a minute. So um, I, I think we don't get to, we don't get too much of a choice of whether we're we're in the simulation or not. When it comes to leadership, you founded Box. It's now a public company, a well known brand. Does has AI changed the way you lead and manage? And, and very quickly, please. I think we're in the early stages of of how AI impacts how we lead and how we manage, and and I really think it. Um, it will come down to uh, this idea of having a super intelligence that is right next to us that can help us make better decisions, more informed decisions, get access to more information. Um, and I think that's really the the, the main role and, and power of AI. Um, I don't think it's going to fundamentally change the role of the manager or of of uh, of of the kind of work that we're doing. I think it really is the next um, you know stage of the human computer uh, interaction and relationship. Um, with just even more of a uh, of a turbocharger uh, of, of value for us. What are the box use cases that inspire you right at this moment? The reason why we're so incredibly excited is if you think about, um, you know, for for the past now, you know, thirty or forty years uh, since we we've had you know modern database technology, uh, y- you've always been able to query and synthesize and run reports on and get insights. From our structured database, uh, so from from our structured data, so you know our CRM data, our ERP data, our analytics data, all of the stuff that goes into a database, we we've been able to programmatically operate on for for ever essentially. The challenge is that we can't do the same with our unstructured data, our documents, our marketing assets, our you know memos, our meeting notes, our plans, our our strategy presentations, all of that content generally remains only useful if an if an actual end user has opened up the file and is looking at it and is working on it. And so now with AI, for the first time ever, we can actually leverage all of that information, all of that intelligence, all of the value that's trapped inside that data, and we can 
uh, ask questions about it. We can synthesize that information. We can summarize it. We can have expertise get applied to it from third-party intelligence um, that uh, that we want to be able to leverage. So for us, we see it as a breakthrough um, in just being able to work with our information. So I'm a lawyer, and I want to look at a, a contract and quickly summarize what are the risky parts of this contract that I should pay attention to. I can now do that in two seconds as opposed to two hours. Um, I'm working on a uh, on a press release for a new product, and I need to get some quick ideas. I can now do that again in two seconds, as opposed to hours and hours of, of sort of brainstorming or trying to figure out, um, you know, some 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 parts when I'm starting from a cold start. So, um, so the ability to use AI to make us more productive, make us more creative, make us more efficient, be able to get new ideas, um, we believe are, are going to be a kind of huge amplifying force in, in how we get our work done. Those comments, okay, the com the comments f from the AI, the summarization. How can I have confidence that they're accurate? That's a big deal. This is what we spend all of our time on. So, um, so uh, both in improving the accuracy, reducing the hallucination, providing the right kinds of citations, so you know why why you saw the answer that you did. Um, those are the the, uh, the the types of things that, that we're focused on, and and we uh, we've been able to achieve uh, you know I think extremely competitive and, and good results um, in uh, uh, you know within our AI solution. Aaron, as we finish up, given your history and background in this in industry, and you have such a broad perspective because of the folks you're talking to. What advice do you have for business leaders today to help them be successful in this AI world? Testing out use cases, seeing where this can have an impact on your business. Um, I think it's going to be, it's very, very hard for any executive or group of executives to kind of get around the table and come up with all the ideas uh, where AI is going to have an impact on their business. I think it's really important to have, have your teams have have you know generally different parts of the workforce, sales, marketing, um, HR, R and D teams come up with ideas, and then have an architecture that allows you to support many of those ideas um, without fra a fragmented approach to how you're going to manage the technology or how you're going to stay secure. Um, but I I do think diving in, iterating, testing, um, but being safe about it is uh, is incredibly important. Okay. And with that, we are out of time. A Just a huge thank you to Aaron Levy. He is the co-founder, CEO, and chairman of Box. Aaron, thank you for coming back again to CXO Talk. We really thank appreciate you. that. And everybody, thank you for watching, especially those folks who ask such great questions. You guys are an amazing audience. Now, before you go, please subscribe to our newsletter, subscribe to our YouTube channel, check out cxotalk.com. We have amazing shows coming up. Thanks so much, everybody. And I hope you have a great day.